I remember a few times as a person that's watched a good amount of your content. Uh oh. I remember. I, re I remember a couple times of you saying that you hate furries. Does that mean that you hate me? Yeah, that's that's a video I specifically addressed. That was that that video is the entire reason I made my reaction is because it was just so. He doesn't engage with the argument at all, and it's kind of offensive just how oh whoa how much he just like kind of scoffs and laughs it off. Like I like his channel; he's talented. But, like, he was not... I don't know why he would even address the argument in his video if he wasn't going to engage it in any kind of honest way. It was actually kind of depressing, so... Was it decided by a jury? Is that how it works? Because if so, that jury was f***ing stupid. Yeah, uh, but I mean, like, I can understand... Had, whoever decided the results of that case had zero comprehension of it. We just tried. I definitely heard the door slam. Oh, is that Adam? FYI. Hello. Oh, hey, what's up? Hi. How's life? Uh... Some good, some bad. Are you excited for things to start opening again? I'm already making travel Humor, plans. $20. That's for sure. Join Are you excited for Cruella? Uh, my roommate is. <laughs> but I don't know how much of it is ironic. I'm Cruella. Uh, they also forced me to go see Aladdin. Um, <laughs> so I just saw the new 2019 remake of Disney's Aladdin, and as expected, it gave me cancer. This movie sucks. It's garbage. Don't watch it. You. And I'm giving this one a 1 out of 10. Very ironically. So th that was the only reason I saw that, but, mm -hmm. like, I don't know. It's a, It looks really dumb. I'm, I'm not excited, but I guess I'm going to see it because of my roommate, so. Okay. I, I, I'm almost 1 million percent going to see it just because I really want to, like, go to a movie theater and buy popcorn and sit and watch a movie again, like, with other human beings. So, I, yeah, I really, I, I basically said that I don't give a f what the first movie is, whatever the first major release is, I'm going to go out in theaters, I'm going to watch it because I miss what's, going to f movies. What's the last movie you saw in theaters? Tenet. Oh, no. In Sweden. Yes. Oh, okay. But, um, yeah. I did not like that movie. I think we talked about that movie, right? Yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah. It was just everything Nolan normally does, like, amped up to an 11. I- You know what mm -hmm. Tenet was? Tenet would have been the coolest, like, six-episode miniseries ever. <laughs> I think. I don't know if I can handle that. I, well, like, more time to, like- it longer? <laughs> well, like, more time <laughs> to, like, I would want more of it. actually flesh out the ideas in the world, and maybe- So, like, everything doesn't have to be crazy exposition, but, like, I feel like- I don't know. <laughs> Okay, maybe not with, like, Tenet itself, but, like, I feel like Nolan has- he always has so much that he seems to, like, want to pack in a f***ing two-and-a-half-hour movie. I feel like if he just had, like, a little mini-series he made, I feel like he could just, like, explore so much more in kind of, like, a more open format. I feel like it'd be, like, a cool, uh, yeah, thing. And then I also think that, like- I, Assuming there's something under the surface that's- that's there, right? But, like, I don't know if there was for Tenet. Ten- Tenet. Oh, never mind. You know? I understand. Okay, so, we're- I think we see the same thing, but we- are making two different assumptions. So I'm I'm looking at yeah. Nolan stuff, and I'm hoping that there's just like he's got a really fleshed out, complicated underneath thing, but he just can't explore all of that in a movie. But you think it's just there's nothing there, and it's just like him like being really pretentious and full of himself. I think the more you try to explain Tenet, the more it falls apart. Yeah, absolutely, of course, for that movie. Yeah. I just so. um yeah I think uh, I think we've seen like some pretty cool like uh, mini series lately. Um, I hope that trend continues. Like, it seems like there's a lot of, like, really good examples. Chernobyl was really good. Everybody liked that. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I enjoyed I, it. I think that's a, a nice format. Wasn't wasn't blown away by it or anything. It was okay. All right, chill. Listen, we all needed something to, <laughs> to hold on to after we all came spinning out of the Game of Thrones timeline, okay? Yeah. And Chernobyl's where most of us landed, all right? Mm hmm. I started watching a, a show called High Maintenance, which is like a kind of lesser known HBO show that has four seasons and it's like every single episode is kind of its own contained story and sometimes for like I don't know maybe a couple minutes maybe longer mm -hmm. uh, there is one consistent character in um, throughout the series and it's the weed dealer and so it's basically just each episode is exploring these like very personal private lives of these people that buy weed from the I guess you could call him the main character, who is also like the writer and show creator. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, it's super, super good. And like some of the, some of the jokes didn't hit that well in the first episode. There was one where I was like, eh, but like, I don't know. It's I love the concept and I love how many different 
ideas and stories and genuine characters it explores. It's, it feels very real and human. Would definitely recommend to anybody listening. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I'm are just you... starting to get into some other HBO shows. Mm -hmm. um, how is this like a newer one or? It's. Cur I think it's still going, and it started in 2016. Um, gotcha. And so it has pretty four new. seasons. Yeah. And then there's um, How to with John Wilson. Uh, produced by Nathan Fielder is also a really great HBO show. Do you know uh, Nathan for you? Um, yes, I watched. I think I've, s I've seen most of the episodes, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, somebody somebody wants us to talk about Invincible. Oh, I haven't watched any. I'm looking of it yet. at the YouTube chat. Yeah. Oh, okay. Have you have you watched? Do you think it's good? Yeah, I watched all of it. I I did enjoy it. It. Uh, I was a little disappointed with season two of The Boys. <laughs> and this, although very different, uh -huh. um, I feel kind of satisfied that, like, adult superhero series, like, mature thing for me. You know, there was, like, a hole that was left from the boys not not being as good as I was hoping. Mm -hmm. And also the fact that it's animated allows it to be a bit more creative, I guess and not look as stupid <laughs> yeah you know yeah because it's really hard to like i don't know how to explain it but you can have like a low budget looking cartoon that and I, i'm just assuming it's only seen like i've only really seen like memes of the invincible thing but it looks like something that could have been animated out of the 90s right it's not like i think it's trying to emulate that style like the yeah. saturday morning cartoon thing right but you couldn't really do like a um you couldn't really do like a What's the name of the actor? He's in Family Guy all the time. Or at least they emulate him. The old Batman guy. Adam West? Yeah, Adam West. You couldn't do like an Adam West Batman callback superhero thing. Because it just, it just wouldn't, you couldn't do anything serious with that. It would be like comical, right? I wonder. I bet it's possible. Do you really think so? I think, I, you know, whenever I think of something that would be difficult to do in film or art, mm -hmm. I consider that to be like an interesting challenge. And I think of how it might be possible, like who would who would head, head the project and what decisions would they make? Mm -hmm. I think anything's possible. Yeah, um, it's possible. It would be difficult. Art, but, but yeah. yeah. It would just have to be, <laughs> there would have to be a lot of thought put into it. Something that I feel like there could be a market for is like taking like old shit from our childhood and like redoing it in a very mature way. It feels like that I, I don't know. I don't know how marketable it would be, but I, I feel like there are people that would watch stuff like that. I'm, I'm There's, sure you, that's kind of what Disney's pretending to do with their remakes, right? No, I mean like adult, adult, not like for like, like an older. Good. Well, I shouldn't even say good. I'm really just saying <laughs> violent. Um, I'm sure you've seen yeah. this. Have you seen like that the Power Rangers short film or whatever on YouTube? Uh, no. I guess I'll see what the hell this is about. It's like it, search Power Rangers short film. Um, or is it called something? You can probably look for like unauthorized bootleg. You oh yeah, I think I might have actually seen this. I don't know how much I did. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like just, okay, yeah, yeah. Just I feel like there's a market for like redoing like a Power Rangers movie where there's like a reboot kind of thing, or they're like ten years into the future, tw or no, it'd be like thirty years in the future or something, but like it's like mm. rated R. <laughs> I feel like that would just be really interesting to watch. I don't know. I would I would love taking a children's property and making it like incredibly explicit but more mm -hmm. ironically. Like if you had like Alvin and the Chipmunks but it was like GTA 5 <laughs> story or something. Sure. Like yeah. I don't know. Like that could be dumb. <laughs> that that could be funny. Mm -hmm. Um I don't know. Yeah, I th I, d I think yeah. But then there's also the other part where it's like, maybe we should stop rebooting everything a million times, but I don't know. Yeah, I think uh, I would like to see more original properties, but people don't watch them, so they don't get made. <laughs> yeah. And they don't watch them as much, I guess. I don't know how much you keep up with, like, Gamer World stuff, but um, it's funny because, like, the oh, yeah. 
the same problems we literally propagate every medium. Um, where like in the film world, you know, people are like, I don't, you know, why does anyone make anything new? They always keep making the same dumb shit. And, and even I'll say, I used to say that, but then when you like, if you Wikipedia the movie and then you scroll down and you look at like box office, it's like, oh, well, it's very obvious why they do it. It's because all of you motherfuckers watch it. And it's the same thing yeah. in the gaming world too, you know, like, um, uh, the people Ubisoft will come out with like another Assassin's Creed or whatever, or another Modern Warfare, another Call of Duty. And people are like, why yeah. do they keep remaking the same fucking game? And it's like, well, because you guys buy it every single fucking yeah. time. What do you mean? It's like, your fault. Yeah, the consumer's fault. That's what I was complaining about the um, stupid, shitty Nintendo thing that they're doing, where they're like releasing the old Mario games, but for like a month. And I was like. They won't do that if nobody buys it when they like they're clearly testing the waters to see if they can profit off of this right? Mm -hmm. to convince people to buy it even if they might not have otherwise or something like oh this is my one chance i have to buy it right now mm -hmm. it's like if everybody just didn't buy it then they might have to they might be forced to adopt better business practices like microsoft when the xbone was launching um you know they were all all these terrible terrible anti-consumer features like Oh, if you take the disc out and give it to a friend, it won't work because it's licensed to your account and the console is always on online Yeah, and shit like that. And then who was it like Major Nelson or somebody who was like, we just can't change it. It's impossible. It's built into the console <laughs> and connect is necessary. And then the pre-order numbers came in and then all of a sudden he's like, we're changing the console. Yeah. It's like, oh, Fuck, okay. How many and then... Connect gets discontinued like a month into the console's release. It's like, mm -hmm. hey, <laughs> I thought this was necessary. Yeah, you liars. I, I feel like I've, I feel like this has come up multiple times in the history of like video game software development, where you hear like, uh, why is it always online? Well, it needs to be always online for a variety of features. Work, but then like day two, there will be like a hack that comes out for the game or some shit. It's like, okay, you can take it offline with this. Like, I don't know why they said that they needed this. Like, it was absolutely not true. Like, yeah. Oh yeah, there's they they lie about this shit all the time. Mm -hmm. Most most. Uh, most of the anti-consumer shit that gets added into games and even movies, other media too, is just to try and protect against copyright, uh, you know, like people pirating it when that's going to happen either way. Mm -hmm. uh, and it only hurts the consumer when you add DRM. Um, Depending on the what The pirates is, always find a way around it. Yeah. Sorry? Depending on what it is, but generally I agree, yeah. Depends on how in intrusive yeah. the DRM is, yeah. Yeah, for console games, it's a lot more difficult. Like, eventually they get, like, six years later, people will, you know, find a way to uh, port it to PC mm -hmm. or emulate it. Um, with films, though, it's it's it was particularly frustrating with uh, region locking. Um, DVD had eight regions. Blu-ray had three regions. And then 4K Blu-ray doesn't have any regions so slowly over time they've admitted that there was no point the entire time yeah um <laughs> because it doesn't like okay so if a if blu ray is only released in germany and that's the only blu-ray that exists of this film and i want to watch the film mm -hmm. why would you not want me to buy the, the film mm -hmm. like do not want the money right yeah the the kind if i'm if I simp hard for corporations here, the one thing that's a little mm -hmm. disappointing is I actually think there are really good reasons sometimes to region lock and do regional pricing um, because sometimes mm -hmm. like certain markets just can't afford like a certain price. So like it, it is nice to have the option to like, because the marginal cost of making a DVD is very low, right? Like, like mm -hmm. just making a DVD is, it's gotta be less than a dollar, maybe maybe 50 cents, I don't know. It's probably really, really, really low, I would imagine. The, the, all the money comes up front when you make the movie. So like, if you have the ability to sell it in like a poorer country and be able to do it at a lower cost, like that's cool. Um, but obviously if everybody just goes there and, and buys it online, then it's like, okay, well fuck, now we can't do this anywhere, right? So there are like legitimate reasons sometimes to do it, but when they when they lie yeah. about it or they say like, well, we need the region locking for the technology, and then it's like, okay, well, no, no one's gonna believe anything you say about anything ever. Yeah, I, I mean, with the internet, and, and also, like, you can buy region-free Blu-ray and DVD players, too. Like, if someone really wants to get around it, they'll mm -hmm. wind up spending more money to try and do it. Like, I have a region-free Blu-ray player because, you know, I I like physical media, and there's a bunch of things that just didn't get released in my region. Um, so, like, people will always find a way around it, but mm -hmm. there was the, um, there was, like, the uh, PlayStation 3 console where the original version, the fat PS3... Mm -hmm. um, was backwards compatible with PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2 games. You could literally just pop in a disc. Yes. And um, 
I wound up buying a PlayStation 3, like, well after, like, the... You know, it was well into it. It was, like, at the end of its run. PlayStation 4 was coming out sooner or whatever, and I really lucked out, mm -hmm. and I got uh, one off of Craigslist that was, like, basically just not even used... Um, and it was like the fat one and it was the highest gigabyte model and it was backwards compatible with all that mm -hmm. And so at the time I was like, okay, well I had a I had like a roommate that was like really obsessed with um, Jailbreaking ps3 s and he just done it like a million times. I'm like, oh, okay, so he, he uh, Jailbroke my ps3 and so even though I was in a situation where it's like, okay. Yeah, I could torrent games on it or whatever like i didn't wind up using it for that mm -hmm. i literally just used it so that i could play blu-rays region unlocked blu-rays and dvds and the the crazy thing about doing that for me was discovering that there was no hardware limitations when it came to the region locking it was literally just like 44 kilobytes of information yeah. on a usb drive that suddenly allowed me to play all of these different films that I've legally bought and mm -hmm. I have on a disc, mm -hmm. but just allows me to actually watch them. And I was so, so frustrated thinking like, you guys are just assholes. You're just lying. Like, yeah. like you know you can do it and you know it's a thing that cus customers want. Like, w especially with consoles nowadays and them saying like, nobody really wants backwards compatibility. Sony said that a few times. Um, and now, now with their recent consoles, they're like, yeah, we'll do, we'll do one generation with Sony, and then Xbox is trying to do a bit more. Well, it's, so it's funny like because they're like, finally admitting, like, oh, people do want it while they're selling all these HD remasters, obviously. But. Well, and they'll say like nobody wants backwards compatibility, but they know that's not true because every single new game that comes out is gimped like a motherfucker for new consoles because they have to make it backwards compatible as well, so that they can sell the same game on the old consoles too. Because a lot of people still do have the older consoles, so even if they don't have yeah. backwards compatibility, in a way, they kind of like program for it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I I, yeah. So I don't know like you're the if you want people to buy a console especially with like the dwindling um necessity for consoles at this point like mm -hmm. the, the only reason consoles exist is for games exclusivity so if you really want people to buy your console and I guess Microsoft clued in that they don't have a lot of exclusives so they have to do something mm -hmm. is you got to make it really consumer friendly and one of the ways to do that is to like actually care about making your games backwards compatible you know, like, oh, if I can have one console, like, chances are the person buying the new Xbox might have a few old Xbox games, mm -hmm. right? It would I, be, it, it's worth a purchase to just be able to have everything in one console and it looks nicer. Yeah, I, I can sympathize a little bit with console manufacturers because they have to, they're up against like so much weird stuff. Like, for instance, we have mm -hmm. kind of these in our brains we have these price points that we think that like games should cost and what consoles should cost and like overriding some of these dollar limitations is very hard like i could be wrong but i want to say didn't the n64 debut at like 300 or 350 dollars or in the ps2 i think was like oh 30? i i have no idea mm -hmm. that was a little i i I didn't have consoles when I was that young. Gotcha. Yeah, that, they they came out for like around that cost, and I'm pretty sure like adjusted for inflation, that's got to be like six or seven hundred bucks. It's got to be like way, way, way more expensive. Yeah, the yeah. PS3 was like eight hundred on on launch for because they had just in, introduced Blu-ray as like a concept. Oh, because a lot of people were buying because for a long time the PS3 was the cheapest. Um, it was the cheapest Blu-ray player. Like you could just yeah, yeah. like a Blu-ray player was like a thousand dollars. Yeah. <laughs> So, Which yeah, is really so, smart on Sony's part. That's why they won the war against HD DVD, actually. Sure. Xbox uh, 360 <laughs> did not natively play HD DVD, but they sold a basically like a um, external drive mm -hmm. that you could basically plug into the console, and nobody bought that. And so Blu-ray wound up winning the war. And since Sony owns Blu-ray, um, and now everything is on Blu-ray, like including xbox games are on blu-ray i'm pretty sure they make a cut just by the game like they make a cut from every xbox game because they're using the format of blu-ray that sony owns so that was really smart i think that's how it works i don't know maybe i don't know what the license agreement is like but yeah it wouldn't surprise me yeah um yeah, this is something sony, we've never sony talked about i don't think we have i'm yes. curious what do you think about rick and morty you know when it was new, mm -hmm. it felt very, uh, very unique and 
I liked that it was kind of doing this weird Back to the Future parody sort of thing, and I liked that it was not only adult and funny, but also, like, existentially dark. I really loved that about it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, like, I liked season three more than I think a lot of people did. Uh, but as soon as season four started, I watched, like, one episode, and I was like, I'm not feeling this anymore. And it wasn't even because there was, like, such a massive drop-off in quality, but because, like, even before season four started, like, it was all just kind of the same thing over and over and over. Mm -hmm. um, and when it wasn't, when it wasn't, like, new or interesting anymore, it was just like, oh, well, I've seen this episode before because I've seen Rick and Morty, but, like, they weren't, it didn't feel like they were innovating, and so I got bored, and I don't know, maybe I'll rewatch season one through three someday, but I'm not, like, excited to or anything. Gotcha. I think, um... What I about think you? Rick and Morty legitimately i think it's like one of my favorite cartoons that i think i'd ever seen for season one i felt like watching a cartoon like that balance out kind of like the more like pretty wholesome like meaningful messages against the backdrop of like you know rick's eternal nihilism and kind of the meaningless and blah 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 i thought that it did that in a super unique really like a, a good like contemporary modern take on it i really super duper liked it um, have you ever heard of the, have you heard of the boondocks? Uh, yeah. And I've seen bits and pieces without okay, fully fuck. watching an episode, but I, like, I'm aware of. Yeah. Okay. Never mind that. I was going to make a comparison, but, um, I, con like concepts, but when I watched Rick and Morty I, season, I do need to get into that. Yeah. When I, when I watched Rick and Morty season two, I, it felt to me like, it felt to me like a really edgy, very young person watched season one and was like, I loved this show. And when you were like, oh, really? You like Rick and Morty too? And it's like, yeah, I loved it. Like, there was so much, like, XD random humor, and I'm gonna fucking, like, do mm. another season of that, and it's gonna be so good. And, I, like, my favorite comparison, I think, like, I think the perfect comparison between, like, what, where, 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 where at least for me personally, I didn't like Rick and Morty was, um, you, you know, the uh, interdimensional cable episodes? Do you remember the first and second one yeah. of those? Yeah. Oh, so, my like, God. The first I have a one. Funny story about that when you're done. Sure. Yeah. The the first one was so good. I thought it was such an awesome, well done episode. The concept was funny, and then like the juxtaposition of the A and the B plot with um, Beth and Jerry and like their love story and like you know what matters in the end. But like all of that came together in like such an awesome way. And I thought that that was like a real. That's probably like, one of my favorite like episodes. Of, like a, and I think it's, these are thirty minute episodes of like cartoon that I've ever seen in my entire life. I super duper 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 love it. And then. I compare that to like season two's like interdimensional cable TV episode, and it's like, LOL, Jerry has to cut off his dick to save an alien guy, LOL, and like, and here's XD random, XD random, XD random. And it was like, oh my God, I like, what the fuck happened? Like, I, yeah, ah, that, that's kind of my feelings on it. Go. Funny story, cable episodes. Yeah. Um, the, uh, so I, I enjoyed interdimensional cable as well. Mm -hmm. And when, uh, when when the new one came out i was watching it as it came out and on the internet there were a lot of opinions and people were generally saying that it wasn't as good and i didn't hate the episode i was like yeah it's it's not that bad and i noticed uh dan Harmon on twitter uh co-creator of rick and morty yeah uh he sent out a tweet uh saying something like <laughs> Uh oh. You know, it's just so sad. Like, there's some, there are a bunch of people that worked hard on this, and uh, we really liked it. I don't, I don't know why anybody else hates it. And then I responded to the tweet with like the nicest comment in the world, saying like, um, you know, I actually, I, I don't know why so many people don't like it. I kind of enjoyed it. And then, like, within that tweet, the, the overall, the overall tone of the tweet is so nice and assuring and within within the tweet that i wrote i i said something like i think jerry's uh story could have been explored a bit more but otherwise i really loved it and he responded with sorry i don't take criticism blocked and like blocked me immediately he's like what it was so weird yeah it was like i was i thought i was defending the guy i thought i was like being nice when everybody else was being mean 
Mm-hmm. And yeah, he like blocked me and one other person. And then later over time, I found out that like uh, he he would he would eventually have like a history of just being a crazy man child, especially on Twitter. There was like a a time where he like spent the entire night drunk tweeting some dude and like telling his followers to harass the, them like while he was like at a restaurant and like throughout this whole ordeal there are other like verified accounts like celebrity hollywood people just being like dude stop like <laughs> what are you doing and just like he spent the whole night like being like everybody bully this guy it was like so weird but yeah he does that it's just i don't, he makes he has good content but holy crap he has some issues yeah i don't know yeah that happened yeah, well, it's not the, not the craziest thing in the world, but now I'm verified. Nice. Oh yeah, I saw that. Yeah. You tweeted, um, Twitter won't verify me, and actually confirmed that I'm too gay to lift. And then you, I think you quote tweeted it, and you're like, oh, this didn't age well, because I think it was like six days old, right? Yeah, and then it just so happened that they started doing the uh, verification thing again. Mm-hmm. Did you like apply for timing. it or did it just happen randomly? You just woke up and I like, actually oh. applied for it. Oh, nice. I just I I noticed uh I don't know, there was like some article or something and uh it was like, "Oh, Twitter is doing the thing again." And then I saw in my account um although I have like six Twitter accounts and I noticed that I only got the ability to apply on my YMS account. So it might be dependent on follow count or something, I don't know, mm-hmm. but I wasn't able to do that on my others and uh, thankfully, there was an option there that was just like, oh, you can link, you, you know, send a link to your website that features your Twitter account, just so we know that you, uh, you're you the person. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was also the option of send a photo of my ID, but I would never do that. I would never send that to Twitter. I don't <laughs> trust them. Yeah. Um, I don't trust them as being a secure website if, like, major people can get their accounts hacked and shit. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Wasn't it like, who was it? Like Bill Gates and Elon Musk got their accounts hacked and then people were posting like, send me like Bitcoin. I don't remember if their accounts actually got hacked or if people found a way to like spoof tweets. I don't remember. No, people are, people are like spoofing tweets for Elon Musk for sure. But there was like Mm -hmm. one incident where like, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Like the Twitter's uh, lack of security Mm -hmm. is why uh, Apple has a verified Twitter account there, but no tweets. They just don't use it. They're just hogging the name mm-hmm. because like they got, they've been hacked a few times and Apple was like, nope. And they just decided they wouldn't use the website really. Yeah. Oh, damn. I just don't, I don't post any personal information in my DMs. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah. Usually when I have private conversations with people, I always assume like, yeah, this is potentially going to get leaked. So, it's just a good way mm-hmm. to live life, I think, when you're like a mm-hmm. quasi internet celebrity. Yeah. Yeah. I use Telegram, the uh, number one chatting application for furries and ISIS. <laughs> Jesus. That's some interesting company. Is there a lot of crossover there? Or? Um, Not that I'm aware of. That's the right <laughs> but, answer. Yeah, you know, it, it has good uh, security or something. I don't know. It's encrypted and. Something, something. Well, the reason why a lot of furries use it is because uh, it's just the functionality of the app is just so easy for group chats and for like organizing events or like um, they have like a thing called stickers where it's just like click a button and you send like image and you can make your own sticker pack. So obviously furries are like creating these custom emojis and all that shit. Mm-hmm. Stuff like their their fursonas reacting in gotcha. ways. I remember, I remember a few times as a person that's watched a good amount of your content. Uh oh. I remember, I, me- I remember a couple times of you saying that you hate furries. Does that mean that you hate me? Um, I would have to see the context in which I hate the furries. <laughs> okay, I think it was a general statement. It's a general we'll statement. Have to, of we'll hatred. have to dig it back up. Okay. I don't know. I might depend. I might just need to get more acquainted with your first son. You might actually be a furry that I hate. I'm just, I just haven't seen that side okay. of you as much. So, you know, it's hard for okay. me. To, you know. Well, so far you've been very nice to me. Yeah, no problem. Right now I think we hate weebs more, so. But that could change, you know. Yeah. So don't get comfortable. Yeah. 
the furries versus weebs thing is interesting. I think that most of the criticisms against furries come from weebs. Because there's a lot of similarities, and it just winds up being a lot of projection. Oh, wait, right. so do you wait, hate weebs? I don't hate weebs, that but I do like kind of like some weeb ironic hatred, when, but... No, I find it I find it like kind of ironic when there's like hatred directed at furries from weebs because it's like All right, you're you're kind of in the same boat like uh, you'll you'll see comments like f with the anime uh, avatar um, Posted on whatever like furry event or like some you know dance or convention or something mm -hmm. and the the comment will be like man I can't imagine the smell there and it's just like I don't know I've been to I've been to furry conventions People are generally pretty hygienic. It's a bunch of like, mostly just like queer people. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to RTX once. Uh, I was like doing a panel there. Uh, and, you know, that's more of like a gaming convention. Mm -hmm. And I finally understood what that comment went when I walked into the, <laughs> the quote unquote rave room at RTX. That was a, there was a wall of BO. And I, I was like, oh, that's why those comments exist. I had never experienced that at a at a furry convention, but holy crap! Damn. Now I'm understanding what people were talking about. Is RTX? Is that like an anime thing, or what is that? It's a uh, Rooster Teeth, and like oh. they have um, like the YouTube network uh, thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they have the um, you could argue that it's anime adjacent, um, because they have the show Ruby or whatever. I remember watching trailers um, for that and getting really excited and like. 2006 i don't think i ever oh wow <laughs> yeah because back the back in the day the only if the only understanding i have of rooster teeth is that they were the guys that did red versus blue and i think back then yeah i don't even think i don't think i don't think it was on youtube then i don't remember if we torrented episodes i don't remember the first episodes of red versus blue if you had to download them but um they had their website and you had to download the uh, individual episodes mm -hmm. uh and there were just like windows media player file yeah. files or whatever mm-hmm I miss those days. I still have the like original DVDs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They had a lot of uh weird uh Easter eggs in the DVDs like you press you press the remote in any direction that you d you don't think you should and you'll get like some weird funny clip because they were just doing whatever the hell they wanted. They were just printing their own media. <laughs> nice, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll always respect uh Red versus Blue because I think it uh, marked like a very important moment in terms of like internet media of like an actual series that mm -hmm. you know although a lot of it was just jokes there was actually like a some structure continuing and, narrative yeah. Yeah. yeah like i don't know like i loved that shit so much like i don't know if i would love it the same now but mm -hmm. i was i watched the first 10 seasons at least mm -hmm. and what i found to be very kind of crazy about it was like in season 10 they kind of they, they almost kind of like retcon everything and that happens in season one but it also makes sense and they do it in this weird way where it's like it's like a twist and you the way that it works it almost seems like they were planning it from the beginning but you know that there's no way yeah that they would have expected there would be 10 seasons of this and it's just like what yeah even if i don't think i'd enjoy them today it was like but that um there was that show and uh, Pure Ownage. Like, growing up watching those two shows. Oh. Just, yeah. Super. I heard about that show, you but I never watched it. Never watched Pure Ownage. Disgusting. But um, that was another show. I heard that, it was like Pure Ponage. Well. Was that it? People will argue. It just... People argue over what. Okay. Yeah. How you pronounce own or pwn. <laughs> but it is own, mm -hmm. by the way. Uh, but yeah. Um, yeah. Way back when. Um, yeah. They had to distribute their first episodes via torrent because YouTube wasn't a thing yet. And. Yeah, yeah, so much back in the day stuff. Mm -hmm. How? Wait, how? Yeah. What is your general age again? I don't know if you're comfortable saying exactly. Uh, I think I'm like a year off from you. I'm okay, okay. thirty right now. Gotcha. Yeah, okay, I'm thirty-two. All right. We grew up like in a really okay. interesting time, like just like right at I'm the glad. precipice of social media existing in high school and everything. And like, you yeah. might have just caught it a little more than I did. Yeah. Yeah, but I still. Uh the the cringiest moments of my life are still not documented so i'm glad yep. they're lost there was like a there's yeah. like an internet event horizon 
where like the closer you get, I don't know what the exact year is. It might be 2006 or 2007 is like the internet event horizon where everything that had fallen into that point in time is now inaccessible to the rest of the universe. Thank God there were no archives there. Cause back then two things were very expensive. Storage was expensive and bandwidth was expensive. It's not like fucking free like it is today where you guys can infinitely mm. upload shit or infinitely store shit on the internet and it's backed up forever. Like back then fucking, it was a really big deal, I think, when, when Yahoo said they were gonna expand their email inboxes to like 50 megabytes or whatever. It might've been 100 megabytes, but like it was really, really hard to store files on the internet back then. You had to buy shit and it was, you had to like, you had to use scary things like FTP. There was no like click and drop anything. Like you had to do a lot of crazy shit back then to get stuff on the internet. So when those websites went down, there was no internet archive. There was no fucking Reddit or imagery. That shit was just gone forever. Mm -hmm. Thank the fucking yeah. Lord Jesus Christ. Holy shit. <laughs> things actually disappeared. Yeah. Although I do, I do have some love for things being archived. I yeah, like having I, well, a record of things. Yeah, I mean, now that I'm 32, I don't mind it. But <laughs> the shit that I said when I was fucking—you know what? Though, <laughs> even at even at this age, I don't think I'm done saying stupid things. I don't I, yeah, think no. I'm completely done. It's not about stupid things. It's just like, I, like I don't know, maybe different just kids. Being are, cringe. No, being fucking like racist and horrible. Not and not even like really being oh, racist. Okay. Yeah, because I was a fucking gamer. Okay? I said some crazy oh, yeah. fucking shit on the internet back then. I don't know, like, and it would have been shit where like people would see it and be like, this guy wouldn't even make it to the Nazi meetings. Like this dude is insane. Like, cause oh. dude, yeah. <laughs> Listen, okay. online gaming was a That's crazy. It was a crazy world back then. Okay. The but, Nazis uh, would say you're too extreme. Exactly. Yeah, they'd be like, you make us look wow. bad. You got it. You need to take a break. Um, but that was just you're you're just mostly talking about gamer culture though not like yeah it was because like the literally like sometimes the goal is like what is the worst most horrible fucking shit you can say to somebody mm -hmm. like in the middle yeah. of a game or whatever and like yeah there's just it was a it was a different time on the internet Oof. yeah i'm glad i'm glad i got to experience uh <laughs> Xbox Live in its the original uh, glory days. days. Thirteen year old, no, yeah. not even like yeah. nine year old kids, like calling everybody the n word and like just telling about like yeah. fucking their mom. <laughs> it's like what the fuck. <laughs> and making weird threats and pretending that their dad owns like something. Yeah, <laughs> on, but yeah. unironically, it wasn't a joke back then. The kids were like serious about it. Like, oh my god. Yeah, and it was all it was always the shittiest mic quality too. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, because a lot of them were using the because you get the built-in like Xbox Live fucking plug-in shit or whatever, right? Was, yeah, man, that shit was. <sighs> so, did you have like consoles? Like you're mostly PC, right? Um, yeah, but I I grew up I grew up on consoles. I mean, everybody did. Anybody that mm -hmm. says different is lying, unless they're like fifty. Um, because like, first of all, making computer games work back then was really hard. Okay. You've got to like, in some yeah. cases back, back, you had to put in the floppy disk. You've got to open up DOS. You've got to start typing in commands to install shit. Like that shit was hard. There was no like double click the executable and like everything is done. That shit was complicated. Yeah. Um, yeah. So consoles were really easy. You just like put in a cartridge or whatever, and then the shit works and you didn't have to worry about it. And yeah. And then also back then, not everybody had computers. So at least in my case, you had like the one family computer. And any time anything goes wrong yeah. with a family computer, it's because of your damn games. You put the games on it, now the computer's all messed up. Meanwhile, mom has 50 million like weather bug task bars or whatever on yeah, her who, browser. Yeah. Toolbar. <laughs> yeah. Oh God, the toolbar is oh, the yeah. air of the toolbars. Yeah. I'm oh. glad that's not a thing anymore. I'm glad we progressed past toolbars. Mm -hmm. It's just like different browsers i remember the first time i discovered you could have a different browser Ooh, that was like that was hacker crazy. shit yeah yeah <laughs> i remember the first uh, time you get, like firefox that's some who you're in, you're in like hacker territory at that point you're doing some crazy shit yeah. yeah i remember all these like default programs and applications of just like ancient things on i don't even remember what version of windows but just like sound recorder you can record your voice and I would I would go on that program and just be like, oh, you can make it go backwards or like really fast. Yeah. And it was like the craziest thing. And it was just so easy to be entertained. And I kind of like I kind of miss that in a way. Yeah, uh, we're like obviously there are like benefits to being connected all the time. But I don't know. I feel like we're very simple uh, objects are like unbelievably entertaining. Those. Yeah. Do you, do you remember those things called yak backs? It's true! 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 Can I have a sip of your drink? No. 
Yak Bear gives you the last word. Yak Bear. Yak Bear. Yes. Yeah. yeah they, a they little a little device that would record your voice and then the, uh, the later ones would like yeah. play it back like that's like insane or whatever, you know? Like 15 seconds of storage space yeah. and like the worst quality you could imagine. Mm -hmm. Those were awesome. The yeah, we got Game a lot of boys with no backlighting. Oh my god, you yeah. Like atta attach like a little like weird snake light. Or if you it. were a Chad, you'd get like the big, like the big screen, like screen magnifier with the battery. Oh, I had that. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I yeah. was a Chad. Yep. A Otherwise, Chad if you're child. in the backseat of the car and you're driving home, you'd have to like, you'd have to sit next to the window and depending on what game you're playing, you'd have to wait for the streetlights oh, yeah, to let you torture. read. Oh, yeah, Yeah. It was so bad, but still nostalgic. I still have my Game Boys. Mm -hmm. I still have all the games for it. And every once in a while, I boot it up and it still works. Um... There's one game that I can't get the same experience from if I decided to emulate it. Uh oh. And it's Kirby's Tilt and Tumble. Because it actually had like a sensor in it that like basically had motion. Like you, you would flip, flick, flick the Game Boy and Kirby would jump. Mm -hmm. So there's no way to emulate that. The Game Boy? Was this in like the cartridge? Yeah, it was like a little, just a little sensor in the cartridge. And it was no bigger than any other cartridge. Mm hmm. Um, but it just, it, it could sense if you were tilting it forward, backwards, left, right, and then flick. Damn, crazy. And that was the whole game. That reminds me of when, um, when Pokemon Gold and Silver came out, it was a really big deal that it could tell what time of oh, day yeah. it was. Yeah, people were like, oh my god. Oh like, yeah! Yeah, when it's morning, we get to catch Pokemon for the morning, and then when it's night, you have to wait till it's night. And a like, hoot hoot. Yeah, yeah well, only at night. only show up at night. Whoa. So, and then, like, the... What what was it? The three legendary Pokemon just ran Riku or whatever Raikou, Raikou, and Entei, and what was the third one? I don't remember. But they ran around the fucking map, and I could never figure oh, out yeah. how to catch them. Uh huh. Because they would just like disappear as soon as you go there. Oh, okay. So this is something that we take for granted. Okay. You can look up, and this is actually something that frustrates me. When I watch like people debating on the internet, because I do politics, one thing that infinitely frustrates me is when people will argue about like just an objective fact that you could just like Google it. Like people, like people are like, well, when did this start? Or blah blah blah. And then people will argue for like thirty minutes. Like just oh, Google yeah, it and look I know it up, exactly right? Exactly what you mean. Yeah, back in our day, you couldn't. You had to pull out the fucking Encyclopedia Britannica, okay? Otherwise, you were going to like Yahoo or Ask Jeeves. Like there, the information there was no Wikipedia back then, okay? Information was not archived well. However, one really cool thing, one old like artifact of that era was game rumors <laughs> like yeah I, did you ever play final fantasy 7 no oh fuck there's a main character that dies in that game one of the, the most have you ever heard like eris dies you can or you can spoil it for me i don't even yeah, care there's a main character that eris dies but like one of the big things about it is like how to revive eris um or with pokemon it was like how to catch mew the mew yeah you gotta yeah. go to surreal was, city you gotta go behind the truck and like there was like all yep, of, that, yeah that, that was the exact one <laughs> yeah. behind the truck and there would be and so... everybody knew it somehow. <laughs> and it's so weird how information passed without the internet mm -hmm. in like every city. Like everybody knew these things. But they weren't being publicized like on the news or probably not even in newspaper. Like I don't know if anybody could even find like a magazine that would have said that. I don't know how that got into the general public conversation about the game. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same thing as like Marilyn Manson removed one of his ribs. Like, that was a oh, big yeah. meme. Like, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. Why yeah. does everybody know these, like, <laughs> these things? But the, yeah, but the, like, yeah, but so there would be so many game rumors that were just completely not true. <laughs> and you can, Oh, like, nothing was true. <laughs> and you had no like idea. Most, most things that were, like, common, uh, common knowledge uh -huh. of just, like, little factoids, like, and you're... Your blood is blue, and when you you cut your skin and it oxidizes, and that makes it red. It's like okay, apparently that's bullshit. Oh yeah, a lot of people. I believe that for a long time growing up too. Yeah, people would say that. It mm -hmm. makes sense because your veins look blue. Mm -hmm. Your blood must be blue, I guess. Yeah. I don't know, but then it's like, why would? Is that the only reason why someone said that, and then everybody believed it? And know. it's really funny because it's just like the Kimba thing, where it's like. <laughs> the more the more of like a factoid that you can make it where it's like you can show off by mentioning it the more it will spread yeah 
and people can be like, did you know that you're like i'm smart i knew that in the same sense it's like did you know that the lion king is actually uh is a ripoff of uh, an old uh, 1950s anime mm -hmm. called kimba <laughs> it's the same name true suspicious i mean it is have you seen the pictures <laughs> yeah i've seen all of them we're coming up on a year anniversary to that video <laughs> My most liked video. Actually, don't, uh, don't DM Sammy, but um, a long time ago, it? I'm pretty sure we watched that entire thing on my stream. Did we not finish it? Oh, shit, oh did you? We didn't finish it. It was like a, you made like oh, a three hour fucking video, wasn't it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know how long. You, we might have only watched an hour though? or two of it, but like, holy shit. I really needed to. No, I know. I got, I really I got that. There are some, yeah. if I, if I left any stone unturned, that would just be like, no, you didn't address. That. Yeah, exactly. And oh my god, I've had bad drug experiences with that th same mentality. But like, yeah, you like people. You know that if you leave something, somebody's gonna be like, "Well, what about that? You didn't even do that." And you you don't want to post like a five minute addendum to like a f***ing, you know hour video. So it's like, well, f it, you know, in for a penny. In yeah, for a and there was the the sheer amount of misinformation that had already existed warranted mm -hmm. that level of dissection, right? Where it's like none of you have watched this show. <laughs> like None of you have looked at the sources here. Cultural. What's really funny is like, like, there were all these like I featured them in my video. All these articles that existed that were talking about the Kimba conspiracy, and then I make my video, and at some point in the near future, it'll be the most viewed Kimba video that exists on YouTube, and that's very nice. Mm -hmm. uh, but you would think that like. You would think that somebody, as a journalist working for some publication, would be like, oh, I've got a story. This person basically debunked the whole thing. But nobody's done that. And some of them clearly watched my video because the header image changed on the uh, <laughs> uh, Hollywood Reporter article. Mm -hmm. And so, like, you know, like they... <laughs> I don't know, because maybe then at that point, if they're working for the same publication, then it, it would imply, like oh, you got this wrong, and that makes the publication look worse. What's also kind of frustrating is around the time that I released the video, um, there was kind of like a little uh, a little war on, happening on the Wikipedia page for the controversy. Uh, and people were citing my video, and then, you know, these top-tier Wikipedia editors would be like, a YouTube video is not a real source, this is an opinion piece. And then, you know, people would kind of try to edit back in a way where it's like okay they're taking some of the points from my video but ones that like you know i had the sources here and blah 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 and mm -hmm. it's like when i'm thinking about that it's like okay the the sources for the controversy in the first place include things like the hollywood reporter article and the hollywood reporter article sources madavi sunder's book and madavi sunder's book sources a youtube video and that's fine, right? Yeah. So, like, I don't know. You, you can, like, connect the dots all the way back to a One YouTube thing. video anyway. Mm -hmm. One <laughs> right? thing that... Um, so, it seems, like, unfair. Something that is very interesting to me, and it's just it's stuff that I've learned as I've done more research online, is... Um, so when it comes to, so obviously my, my realm is more like political debate and everything. When it comes to like academic stuff, if you were to think of like a, if you were to think of like, a, you know, like a, 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 what seems like a complicated subject like immigration or minimum wage or like rent control or whatever, right? You would think that like, okay, if we are going to, um, if we're gonna have an intelligent conversation, there's probably like hundreds, maybe even thousands of studies on every single topic. But when you actually start mm -hmm. Googling around and you start like reading what's cited, right? There might be like, you know, you, you know, you Google like something on discrimination in uh, discrimination in the workplace and you might mm -hmm. find hundreds of articles. But what actually happens is like people are all generally sourcing like the same two or three studies, like almost yeah. every single time. It's yeah. going to be like about like the same two or three studies. And that's the same with like entertainment or pop culture or or almost anything where you find that like um, everybody is basically going back to the same two or three things. I got um this is I'm trying I'm not trying to make it political, but this is like where all my background is. Right. I got into an argument over like whether or not did MLK support riots or not. And um 
oh, you yeah. know, a lot a lot of people were, you know, arguing like, oh, MLK did support rights. Like, you just don't know, like, uh, rights are the language of the unheard, rights are the language of the And I heard that quote so many times. And so I Googled, like, did MLK support rights? And, you know, I got like four or five different articles, one from Jacobin, I think one from Vox, a couple where it's like, you know, in the, in the later part of his life, MLK did support rights. And all of them were citing the exact same speech. And it was funny because when I went back and I actually just looked up, like, MLK speeches were meant to be understood by the common person. These aren't academic. You can go back and read it. And when you read it, he unequivocally did not support riots, even at the end of his life. It was very obvious when you read the whole speech. And it was like, it blew mm -hmm. my mind when I read this. And then I started Googling back like all the articles. And then when I would read them, it's like, okay, I understand what part of the speech you're saying, but like, why didn't you read like the next paragraph? Like, or why didn't you go on like a little bit further? Like, uh, and it was crazy to me that every single one, because I, cause then I went looking for more information or data, but like every time I would stumble on a new article, it would all sort, it would all cite the exact same speech. And I'm like, this is fucking crazy. Um, mm -hmm. And it was, I hate to say this because I'm so lazy. Um, I don't remember who gave me this piece of advice, but somebody had said like, if you want to be like really smart on the internet, what you really got to do is you just have to read a book or go to a library because on the internet, a lot of the resources are just recycled and reused. And if you go to a library and read a book, you're going to get like new information because on the internet, everybody talks using like the same two sources. And man, that seems to be mm. really true. Jeez. Yeah. I don't know. I have a, uh, I, I generally am untrustworthy of people and <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. sources in general like i feel like i have to look things up on my own and so that's why like there's a lot of uh there's a lot of conversations where like there's very few topics that i feel very confident speaking about mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that i have opinions on but i don't feel like i'm actually informed enough to be able to argue a position on you know, sure. And I, f I feel like the 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 most confident that I am at positions are ones where they're more to do with myself than some sort of other objective historical concept or political concept. Sure. Or it's like, OK, well, if we're if we're talking about something like ethical and it's a subject that I've actually put thought into, then I can speak with some confidence about it because it's more about myself and I know myself. It's more about me mm -hmm. than it is about, you know, something academic. Um, and then obviously, I don't know, media is the other one. Just depends on the piece of media. For I, sure. I can speak pretty confidently about Kimba. <laughs> For um, sure, yeah. Yeah. I was the only one that watched the anime. I mean, it that's all like anyone it. had to do. That's what's so crazy about the conspiracy is because it lasted 25 years mm -hmm. and all anyone had to do was watch an anime. Right. Because yeah. you would notice that it's not like the same. Like it, you, step one is noticing that it's not a movie and it's actually like 10 movies in a TV show <laughs> like mm -hmm. that lasted like it's 3000 minutes worth of shit. It's like, wow, <sighs> that's that's the only information that anyone would need to know mm -hmm. to start peeling away at like how the dishonest lies. that it was. But it, the, it propagated for so long. Mm -hmm. I truly do believe and you might this might be the same for you. I really do feel like I remember reading the Kimba thing in either like a fact book or magazine when I was like, I want to say like 12 or 13 years old it like, is pre-internet uh, yeah it's it is actually that old yeah it was a thing like from the release of the lion king mm -hmm. um tezuka had already died at that point but uh it originated with like some japanese animators uh saw the film and uh like wrote some public letter or something there were like a few of them but like mm -hmm. i don't know like Again, you know, if anybody who's watched my video to the end would know this, like Tezuka's family was never on board with that, right? Yeah. Um, like his company, his family, like they they were all like, yeah, uh, if there was inspiration, he would have been flattered. And uh, regardless, there's, you know, these are wildly different properties. Yeah. But just somehow it's like, I don't know, like they were just like a bunch of really angry and virtuous people that decided to speak on his behalf and create these arguments where they were using him and his family who were never on board with the controversy but using them as like part of their argument being like They're they being stole from these people and he's there's these poor little japanese artists they 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 
got broke and died or something. I don't mm-hmm. know. It's like this weird emotional appeal. that Something that might be, I don't know so if you've ever bizarre. spent any time on this, but I am almost positive. I don't know why I have this memory, but I'm almost positive that the exact same book or magazine that I read this factoid out of, I feel like right next to it was a factoid about um, J.K. Rowling copying the Harry Potter story from something else. Like another boy that had These a scar, things... blah, 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 blah. I don't know if you've ever heard of this one, but maybe that could be like your next project. Or I don't know if anybody knows what I'm talking I mean, about. I swear to f- God, I've, like... re- I've read this same thing too. Yeah, uh, and that's why part of my video I addressed like other forms of media and just like you have to take it on a case by case basis and think about the likelihood of whether or not you could create something independently. Like, is it mm-hmm. reasonable to assume that these two properties can exist without one being influenced by the other? Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, if, if the framework is it's an animated lion movie then it's like okay well yeah, yeah then it makes sense that this would probably blah 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 yeah blah. people simultaneously right. develop um, calculus like <laughs> we pr- you probably have mm-hmm. dogging animals teaching yeah. life lessons like yeah yeah there's um there's another uh copyright controversy i don't know if you're familiar it's a uh, composer yoko kano oh yoko Ka- yeah Cowboy Bebop yeah. is what I know her most for, but Wolf's Ranch, she's done a ton yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Have you heard about the controversy at all? The no. copyright one? Is it like that she no? ripped somebody okay. off, or she thinks somebody ripped her off, or what? You know what? Um, Uh-oh. And I, I, hope you, I hope you believe that I have actually given thought about this before saying this, but I believe that she did... Uh, she did. She did what I would consider to be ripping off in some instances. So there, there are these video compilations. Um, okay, I got it here now. Like, I need to hear one of these. Yeah, yeah. So the uh, the one that I would uh, say was the moment where I was like, yeah, that's that's too much. Was uh, okay. I, I'll probably send you a link right here. Mm-hmm. Actually, if you're at all familiar with the original song, so the Yoko Kano song plays first, and I was already familiar with the original song that was being uh, allegedly ripped off and so at this moment I, I didn't even need the side-by-side comparison I was like uh-oh this this is this is too much but yeah listen to it all right I'm gonna listen to like one and a half minutes of this okay the very least is like very 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 heavy template going on yeah yeah see if you're working in the composition industry Mm -hmm. for films or tv shows you're not necessarily just creating songs uh that you feel you know come to you and you're inspired you're like you're not necessarily writing music for the explicit purpose of like expressing something from yourself Mm -hmm. you're writing music that the director is telling you to write. And a very common thing uh, that exists in film and television is temp music, where the director uh, or producer has an idea of a song already in mind. Mm -hmm. And perhaps they even wrote the scene to that song, but either way, it winds up being used in like the storyboard and there's like an edit with that song in it. And then the director or producer tells the composer, Mm -hmm. I want the song to sound like this. So. I and whether or not it's Yoko Kano's call in terms of how similar it is to the original, mm-hmm. that happens a lot, and that would I, I would say that that's very likely for why there's so many of her songs that uh, I you know sound way too similar. I've seen the thing on temp music, and I definitely believe it happens in film. I would be surprised though if it happens the same way in anime, just because of the nature mm-hmm. of how those things are created. Um, so like, for instance, when you do, uh, when you do a movie, um, I'm explaining this, but I'm more asking cause you're going to know more about this than me. Um, my guess is that at the very least, at the very least you've shot like four times as much footage, if not more for a particular movie you do. So you've got like a lot of stuff to kind of like edit around. 
Um, so, like, if, if, you, if you've got, like, a two-hour movie, at the very least, you've, like, shot, like, and professionally shot, like, you know, like, eight hours of footage, if, if not more, if not dozens or hundreds of hours of footage, I guess, depending on the types of takes we're talking about. So, I can imagine more there, like, cutting to, um, like, trying to edit or cut to temp music, but for animated stuff, I don't think that there is as much, like, excessively animated stuff such that they can cut around that um, and, and be making those same types of, like, editorial cuts or whatever to temp music. I would imagine that like you don't have to mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not dependent on the amount of footage you have really because like what they're cutting to they're literally just dragging a song into the timeline and a mm -hmm. the songs incorporation if let's say they're using temp music could have been incorporated as early as like the screenwriting process like they could have written the scene around that song's existence mm -hmm. and even if they didn't that doesn't you know you can still plop a song in there and be like this works um, not necessarily everything needs to be like timed to a specific degree, right? Sure, not yeah. everything. It doesn't need to be like a Looney Tunes cartoon where there's like a an sound orchestra for playing every as the yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, it, like when you're using temp music, you're more or less representing a tone. Mm -hmm. And if the director or producer really like the tone of something that they know exists, uh, then they can be like, oh, I want it to sound like this, and they use this. You, you know, they, it doesn't necessarily even have to like be edited into it before uh before yoko kano gets told to make a song like that they could literally just send her a link to the original song or a copy of the original song and just be like okay make it sound like this and then you know maybe it's a very similar tempo maybe it's not mm -hmm. uh but yeah there's other examples for yoko kano there was uh, somebody i i made like a little um uh stream to this and posted it on my highlights channel and then uh the co in the comments there are people with even more examples than uh mm -hmm. and also i'm initially the only thing i'm disputing is I'm, i don't know 100 percent if like there's the same culture around like temp music and anime but this mm -hmm. sounds at least these two examples sound very yeah. I, well, I shouldn't have said template because i gave the impression of temp music when i said template what i mean is that like it very much sounds like somebody was listening to one song mm -hmm. and then they were writing a yeah. new song using the other one as a very 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 clear template um yeah, yeah. and and it really like when i when i uh made my own little video on this uh, i got some comments and i feel like i should probably address this type of thought since it seems to be like common enough that mm -hmm. you know enough people share it um i want to make it clear that like I don't think that every single piece of media can't be inspired by something else because that's inevitable. Like every, of course. everything's inspired by something else, whether indirectly whether, or directly, whether consciously or subconsciously. Mm -hmm. um, that can exist, but if you know that you're you're taking inspiration from something else, if I were to write a song and be like, I want to capture the same feeling as this other song or the same moment as this part in this other song. If I do that and I don't, I couldn't even know, I don't even know if I have really, it's, I don't really do that thing often. But if I were to do that, I would make, I would make a very large effort to change enough about it so that no one could trace back what the inspiration was. Mm -hmm. The problem with Yoko Kano's music, a lot of these songs is that it's so incredibly obvious where the inspiration is because it, like if, you could you could play one of her songs to someone a bit less familiar with music and they would confuse it for the original for sure where yeah. it's like there's not enough of the of her own input of her own personality in it mm -hmm. to justify a different piece being created and this is also kind of going into the fair use argument where sure there's no such thing as fair use in japan technically mm -hmm. and even if it were going to be a fair use argument then theoretically the original would be credited but i think the same principles generally apply where it's like if you're if you're trying to claim you're not copyright infringing something it should be a you thing like you, there should be you in the yeah in the song. there's it like just be you know, only it should justify its own existence. Yeah, and there's only so much when we're talking musically that you can copy and it's like, okay, you know, like ripping off like a motif, like a little melodic idea or something is, you know, th these are, I say ripping off, but I mean like if it's done well, you, you would you, technically you call it a musical quotation, right? Like there, there are things like this that you can do for sure. Um, but like when we're talking like when you're copying like structure of instrumentation, when you're copying the rhythm, when you're copying like the exact intervals for the changing of the melody, when 
and you're copying the exact chord progression. Like at that point, it's like you basically like you're doing like a remake of the song almost. Yeah, and at least yeah, for the first there, two, there's, like, a, there's yeah. like an even worse one. Let's see if I can find the. Uh... Oh yeah, and it's a it's this is a different a different kind of uh, rip off. It's like done differently, but it's also just so clear. You want me to listen to this first one for how long? That's that's enough. Okay, okay. Do you know what two five ones are? Uh. I'm sure if I, I'm sure I could understand it. But, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. You know, so I just, they don't have okay. I could be wrong. If, if what you're trying to say is that like mm -hmm. the composition is very simple in this song, then I would agree with you. Okay. I'm just going to listen like, to this. At, what's happening musically. Yeah. I'm just going to say that at 111. Um, I could be wrong. I don't know if a, a couple of my jazz guys in chat. I think that this Craig Armstrong, this sounds like a two, five, one. I don't think it's the same type that is normally prevalent in jazz, but yeah. But okay. Let me listen into this 111 in here. I mean, this is very, 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 very similar for sure. Um, mm -hmm. The only thing, the only reason I would let this slide, there's like a very, 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 very common, like mm -hmm. jazzy, like these. Um, these like two, five ones will show up everywhere in jazz. And that's technically, that's all mm -hmm. this is, but the string pattern being the same and then the voicings being very similar makes yeah, it a little bit more suspect. In the exact though. same chord and then the introduction of the new octave mm -hmm. in a very similar way. Yeah, and yeah. also if you listen to like the percussion bits, it's like, it's not like identical, but it's like, okay, that's, that's pretty much the exact same idea for what's happening percussion wise like yeah the rhythm part is what i when they when i talk about the earlier two that i think hurts it the most too because it's not just a melody or it's not just like a single yeah. motif it's that they're copying like the whole structure like the, the way yeah. that the song changes up and everything too yeah mm -hmm. the unique qualities about the song are also copied over yeah yeah it's like any anything you could do to make it unique it's just it's, I don't know. It's 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 a little uh, it's a little sus. Let's just call it sus. Mm -hmm. And then, especially if you get like a history of doing this stuff, it's gonna be yeah. Aren't you more, yeah. I mean, what really helped me to uh, come to become comfortable saying that I would consider her to be somewhat of a plagiarist mm -hmm. is that I didn't. I was not aware of this controversy. Um, and I watched a film called called Judas and the Black Messiah. And I had, I had listened to a lot of Yoko Kano's music. I like the Wolf Rain sound, Wolf's Rain soundtrack. There's a lot of great music mm -hmm. from that. Um, and then I watched Judas, Judas and the Black Messiah, and uh, most of the score for the film was great. Also, it was, it's a really great movie overall. I, I would recommend it. Mm -hmm. um, but musically, mostly just really cool, interesting, unique stuff going on. And then there's one moment... Uh, not just one moment. There's there's actually two uh, instances of this same song being used. I was like, this sounds this sounds exactly like one of these songs from Wolf's Rain. And then I stopped the movie because I was watching it at home because pandemic. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to YouTube and I looked up uh, the old song that I remembered from the Wolf's Rain soundtrack. I'm like, wow, it's not just like it's not just the piano intro, but it's even like the section going into the strings. And I was like. What the hell? And I thought that Judas and the Black Messiah had Copied ripped off. off Yoko Kano. And I made a video saying, like, this song, I love the music in this video, but I, this, there's too many unique qualities about this particular song in the soundtrack that are identical to Yoko Kano's song. And, you know, maybe a little bit autistically and unnecessarily went into too much detail about it. But, you mm -hmm. know, I, I like to... If I'm going to make a claim like that, I want to justify it. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden... Um, I come to find out after the fact uh, that that was the one song in the soundtrack that actually wasn't written by the two composers that scored the film. Oh, it came from and another. And it was actually a song that had existed in the 1970s by uh, Bill Evans. And I, li and I was like, oh, this Bill Evans song. So that came first. I was like, oh, so I guess if somebody ripped off the other song then yoko kano would have had to have done it because wolf's reign is like 2005 mm -hmm. bill evans is the 1970s and then i after that i figure that out and then it's like oh wait actually there's a lot of instances of people claiming that she's ripped off other songs and if you go through like the whole um compilation video that i linked mm -hmm. most of them i would say fall under uh having enough unique quality is away from the original that I wouldn't even care. I would mm -hmm. say the vast majority of instances that people have cataloged 
of her supposed alleged plagiarism are ones where it's like, it's not similar enough that I would even care. But because of that one instance no. that I had, I guess, discovered with the wrong uh, conclusion initially, uh, because of that, and then those two other examples I showed you, I was like, those ones are just far too unique and they, they don't justify their existence enough. Like this, it, it convinced me at that point because I was like, okay, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't buy into like some meme that other people sold me. Like this is something that I felt independently of that. Something um, that um, I've always wondered yeah. then, that, that this would be the place to look next, but it's really hard if you don't have the background and I, I don't, um, but like, uh, in in my opinion, um, did you watch Cowboy Bebop? Uh, not a lot of it, no. There are there are there are, and I I might just be wrong. If there are people that know more about jazz music. Feel free to step up. But so somebody went to school for mm. saxophone, played a lot of big man and jazz music, and then transcribed some solos, listened to some bebop, which I fucking hated. The writing for a lot of the Cowboy Bebop songs, these are really good pieces. Like Tank, yeah, I've heard or the music. Rush. Like these are lines like um, just if I were to look at like and you know and I you know I could be wrong but like if I were to listen to the intro just this one line this just one intro line from Cowboy Bebop this so, Somebody with like that's like a no offense, but that just like writes music for anime being able to churn out songs like this is very 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 impressive that, you, oh yeah. yeah, I'm not denying that she's talented at well, all. Well, no, well, that hold is, on, that that's not that's yeah, that's like, not what I'm saying. What I'm wondering is, okay, yeah. is now I wonder if these were lifted from older like bebop or big band pieces that I just don't know about. <laughs> that's what I'm curious about. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate uh -huh. that like if somebody has that kind of uh, controversy, then you have to kind of be skeptical about anything that they put out, mm -hmm. right? Because I've always wondered because because so like it's unfortunate yeah because like that's like that's really 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 mature writing for somebody that just does like enemies like oh well I'm gonna make something jazzy lol because like I can imagine like what somebody would do like there's like a million like little blues things you do if you wanted to write like cute jazz stuff but like I feel like the writing for the bebop soundtrack is like very 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 mm -hmm. mature it's very well done but like yeah. yeah I don't know yeah and I love the wolf rain soundtrack also even though now I. have you know, now almost all the songs I associate to like Bill Evans, but uh -huh. still, I like even just the choices of having that kind of tone and sound and emotions in used in the right way in the right scenes. You know, that's something to appreciate. It doesn't ruin the the overall product, I guess. Um, and you know, like I said earlier, it's entirely possible that it's not her idea that she's just work you know she's composing what the show creators want to hear so we don't know how much of this lifted inspiration or temp music mm -hmm. allegedly right we don't know how much of that is her doing it or just the people wanting something to sound like that mm -hmm. maybe maybe there As were bits usual, of inspiration used for pieces of temp music and she, she created something that um that was unique enough that it didn't feel like uh, it was ripping it off. And then the show creator said, no, you got to make it, it. It doesn't sound like I want it to. I want it to sound more like that. And then maybe she had to alter it until it sounded way too similar. Also, I saw that link you just opened. Uh, mm -hmm. Somebody just thinks that shot out just, yeah. Jazz pianist. Yeah, that's that's a video I specifically addressed. That, was, that, that video is the entire reason I made my reaction is because it was just so... He doesn't engage with the argument at all, and it's kind of offensive just how oh whoa how much he just like kind of scoffs and laughs it off. Like I like his channel; he's talented, mm -hmm. but like he was not. I don't know why he would even address the argument in his video if he wasn't going to engage it in any kind of honest way. It was actually kind of depressing. So, uh, yeah, if anybody took his video seriously, then uh, please watch mine because I I go over what he says wait so uh, what does he piece say piece. i hope that the sentiment of the soundtrack he is essentially on wiley he'll believe it that's he time. he categorizes uh anybody who thinks that yoke that yoko kano plagiarizes music he says that they're just people who want to pretend that they're smart by saying that they knew of the earlier thing first and then he says 
that uh, everything is inspired by everything, which is something that I kind of agree with, you know, whether consciously or subconsciously, you know, like everything comes from something else before it. Uh, but he kind of just uses that as like a, a cure all, like do doesn't, he doesn't engage with the argument. He doesn't go over any specific examples. He just pretends as though he's looked into it thoroughly. Okay. Uh, but if you listen to the actual words that he says, he mm -hmm. says things like, I, I, I was upset to discover that people were saying that she rips. Like, can you give okay, me like two minutes to just like one, right? times two? I just, I now really want to hear what he says. Can oh, you? please. Yeah. Okay. It, he doesn't address it at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to go into, it's like almost halfway through the video. You'll find it. Okay. Um, let me just, I'm just going to, I'm just going to boom forward real quick. Let me just listen. Go for it. It's I'm just like, what's the thing that I fucking okay, came before it? I knew about this before it. I'm cool because I knew about something that apparently came before it. It's stupid. It's just dumb. This video was made possible by Skillshare. Stay tuned to find out how you can take my brand new course as part of a free trial. Hey, everybody, my name is Charles. Today we are looking at the soundtrack to Cowboy Bebop. Now, anime is a world that I, don't know much about to be honest. I, I've never really gotten into it uh, for no particular reason other than I just, I don't know, I just haven't. But a lot of my friends, a lot of you guys have told me about some of the incredible music, and I've heard some of the incredible music that comes from that world. And so I figured, why don't we take a look at some and I'll just kind of give my immediate reactions. Maybe we talk a little bit about some of the breakdown of it, how it's constructed, and maybe some of the influences that exist within it. And one of the number one recommendations I've gotten from you guys and from a bunch of my friends is the soundtrack to Cowboy Bebop, written, as I'm sure you guys know, by Yoko Kano, who in the process of making this video, I, I've learned a ton about, and I'm pretty blown away. And we'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. First, let's jump into this and let's take a listen to the soundtrack to Cowboy Bebop. The first thing we're gonna listen to is, of course, Tank. <laughs> Oh, oh, wow. So one of the things that sticks out to me immediately is obviously the big band writing, like the arranging. Most of you are probably familiar with it, in case you're not. Arranging basically just means you have this set of chords and melody, and, and how are you going to distribute that throughout the band? So it's individual part writing for like first trumpet, second trumpet, third trumpet, fourth trumpet, and then trombone, saxophones, rhythm section, all that stuff. I have done some big band writing, and when I was in school, we had to take classes uh, for arranging. That was one of the things that we really focused on was different techniques and methods for writing for horn sections. What to do if you give the trumpets a certain grouping of notes, then what do you then do with the trombones? And what sections can mimic each other, and how do you pass ideas around? How do you create counterpoint between sections? The building blocks of good arranging. I'm hearing all of it in this. There's this thing that sometimes can happen where TV shows or movies, I guess, they can sometimes attempt to create music that is in a particular style without fully understanding what that style is. And, and, and when that happens, the music that results often sounds kind of corny or cheesy. That is not what's happening here at all. This feels extremely authentic. The feel, the horn writing, it's totally authentic and it sounds great. <laughs> The trumpet section, especially like the lead, they're not nailing the parts, you know? I feel like there's like a there's a charm to that almost. It's real, it's a live take, it's it's gritty. I kind of dig that actually, the fact that it's not perfect. There, there sometimes can be, even with great bands, I mean, what would be an example? Maybe, uh... Wait, really? Damn, I've looked at these scores. Um, I don't know if there are any trumpet players um, in chat. They play these parts. These are really, really, really high partials for trumpet players. Um, fuck, I'm not gonna be able to, I'm not gonna be able to find, I don't know if anybody like, these are really high partials for trumpet players. Like this would be out. I'm pretty sure this would be like unplayable by 99% of even like Texas high school fucking bands. Like you're looking at like college at the very least, even be able to hit some of the partials for some of these notes. These are, I think these are really, really, really high. Um, I, th I feel like most people that play this are, are playing at a very high level. This this must be like a professional group, like studio musicians playing this. I, I, I don't know what he meant by that comment. I'm being like really autistic or something. I don't know, but um, I don't know if some of you are familiar with like the Gordon Goodwin Big Fat Band. You want to talk about perfection, right? Like everything is just all the parts are nailed, and the production is quality is extremely high. As great as that band is, sometimes I feel like kind of takes away from the grittiness of, of the big band sound. That's obviously up to interpretation, but I feel like here the sort of grittiness and the realness and, and the very evidently live take. There's something cool about the imperfection. I kind of dig it. <laughs> A little bit about kind of what's happening here, the form, form-wise. This is a 12-bar blues. A lot of you may have picked up on that immediately, but it definitely is not just obviously a 12-bar blues because some of the the, the da, -da, da, -da, da, -da, da da some of those harmonic movements that are going on there are not purely indicative of the blues. It might, might throw you for a loop if you're not really listening for it. So that is what's happening here. It is a 12-bar blues. <laughs> Wait, hold on. I'm sorry. Give me one second. Oh no, he's right. Okay, sorry. I was just I was saying. Okay, maybe that's, I'd have to go back and look, but I think that might be some sort of variation, maybe like a, an interlude thing. Really well written. The backgrounds and the horns as the underneath the solo are super cool. I really dig this, this one rhythmic device that has been used a couple of times that's a little bit unexpected. <laughs> That is so sick. Okay, so like, I don't know, in my mind anyways, I'm expecting it to go. So like, you got on. It's a fairly common rhythmic thing, a melodic thing to sort of wrap up a phrase, right? But here, we let it, we let that silence just pull a little bit more. We get this. And the fact that it just drops right on the downbeat and then goes. I think that hesitation there, where you're almost not expecting it, the hesitation of just being like. Bang! It's so sick! By the way, just as a side note, I've been doing some research on Yoko Kano to try to find out, you know, everything that I possibly can about her, and I was kind of annoyed to come across accusations of her stealing stuff, and there was a particular video that everybody was pointing to, it's like, ooh, this is the, this is the, the proof that she stole uh -oh. all this stuff, and I'm like, I'm, as usual, when there's accusations like this, probably from somebody who doesn't really know what they're talking about very much, and it's just like, don't, don't put this, this, this thing that, that I thought that came before, I knew about this 
before it, and, and, and I'm cool because I knew about something that apparently came before. It's stupid. It's just dumb. I understand if people who don't fully understand what they're listening to can hear something and hear the similarities and not understand the difference between influence and blatant plagiarism. But plagiarism is literally the exact transference of something that already existed and just using it again and then taking credit for it. Okay, wait, real quick. I don't know why people still use this elementary school definition. Plagiarism is not a one-to-one -one copy of something, okay? That is not oh, true. Yeah. That is not <laughs> true. Yeah. You learn that in English school, uh, in English class when you're in third grade, that if you just change some of the words around, it's no longer plagiarism. Plagiarism does not have to be a one-to-one -one copy, okay? Plagiarism comes in many different types of forms. Don't ever repeat that. That's super duper cringe, guys. Yeah, there's different types of plagiarism. Mm -hmm. What he is referring to is verbatim plagiarism. Yeah. But that's not what plagiarism is you can also literally just if you have the same structure as something it can be plagiarism and as we we've heard from these yoko kano songs some of them have the exact same structure mm -hmm. yeah. right okay sorry hold on so. i was listening to him uh, shit all over you one sec and that's not anything that happened here at all. Completely baseless. And and I, I can hear the influences, but if, if you're going to point out the influences to these specific songs that you found that are magically, oh my god, this sounds sort of similar. And like, you're not going to point out that everything else that she has written and many other composers have written, everybody's influenced by something else. All of, everything I've ever written is influenced by something else. John Williams jacked Gustav Holst's entire sh Like, that's just how this stuff works. It's not plagiarism, it's influence and it's, it's inspiration. Unless there's a, there's a, an actual stealing of a melody and a chord progression and just writing the same thing over again and taking credit for it. That would be what plagiarism is, but that's not what's happening here. I found that. Stealing of the melody uh, and the chord progression and writing is. I, well, I guess I would have to see which video. He, so his everything he's saying is technically true, um, I, but it, it would depend. Like you do need to say you can't just say like, oh, this sounds like this, so it's plagiarism. You would need like a specific example. I don't know what your original video is that you wrote on this. So, um, oh, he's not. He's the, he didn't make a response to me. I made a response to him basically. Oh well, because I'm curious because so. he's referencing because he said there's a really popular video on the internet or, on the video by somebody. He's, he was talking about. Uh, the thing that I sent you is just the compilation stuff. Oh, um, okay, yeah. So, that compilation yeah. stuff demands more of an explanation than just what he's saying. Um, just what he's saying would, would apply if there's like a section that sort of sounds like something else, but it's like a different rhythm and maybe a few different intervals. But like what like the stuff that was linked earlier is like a, a lot more compelling than that. I think it would demand it, a little bit more of an explanation than what he's giving right now. It's pretty clear that he didn't listen to, listen to a whole lot of it. And if maybe if if he did, then he might have listened to it a bit passively because I like again he opens up his conversation saying I was disappointed to hear that people were accusing her like okay right off the bat you've kind of admitted like you have a perspective before you even you know you, you're not going into this like too charitably you know yeah I mean to, like uh, I can be a little sympathetic towards him especially yeah. because music copyright is oftentimes very f cancerous. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm sure you've seen sorry. Adam Neely has done videos where, like, there'll be a guy that wants to sue somebody because they've they've taken, like, th like three-quarter notes of, like, the way that a melody works. F I wish I could remember Adam Neely's example of this. It was a really big court case for a pop song or whatever. And it was, like... It was uh, Katy Perry Dark Horse, right? Yeah, was it? Wasn't it? It was, like... Now, the two songs don't share the same melody, nor the same chord progression or bass line or drum groove, but they do share a similar synth ostinato, or a repeated melodic fragment that helps support the main melody. It's a descending phrase in staccato quarter notes that starts on the mediant in the key of A minor, the third degree of the scale, and descends down to the tonic. Yeah. It was something like this. Yeah, yeah, something like that. And I somebody wanted to. Bullshit to too. Yeah, and like yeah. that's. So if, if he's coming at it from that perspective, which is honest to God what I generally assume when people are like, oh, we copied it. Like, yeah. I could be sympathetic to that. But if you're going to like call that out in a video and you're putting like your reputation as a musician or whatever on the line, I would expect you to be a little bit familiar with what you're critiquing first, right? Like. Yeah. Yeah. And also, like, there's. Unfortunately, you know, I make my video and then some people are like, Adam, but if the world functioned uh, the way you wanted it to, then uh, people wouldn't be able to write songs because they would just be accidentally uh, ripping people off. It's like, I'm sure that does happen. And in the Katy Perry Dark Horse situation, that was just complete bullshit. Yes. No, that shouldn't that shouldn't have won. And was it decided by a jury? Is that how it works? Because if so, that jury was fucking stupid. Yeah, uh, but I mean, like, I can understand... Had, whoever decided the results of that case had zero comprehension of how music actually works. Yeah, right? exactly, but and I would so expect... I just want to be clear that I don't... I, I don't think that a lot of these major cases are legitimate, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of their ruling. Uh, but when I look at something like Yoko Kano, <clears throat> it seems to be pretty consistent throughout her career, and it's just, like... You know, it's one person, and it keeps happening, and the similarities are... Even if it was just a one-off thing, 
the similarities are so similar that it's like okay here here's here's how i would phrase this there are many songs that exist where you can point out inspiration uh for for what inspired it right mm -hmm. um you could you could point to john lennon's imagine for a lot of songs that it ex existed after it mm -hmm. the problem with yoko kano's inspiration is that her songs are the most similar out of every other songs that exist multiple times mm -hmm. you cannot find a single song that is more similar to uh, that Matrix one to take you on a roller coaster than Yoko Kano's song. Sure. Right? I, I would challenge someone to find a song that is more similar than hers. And same with that uh, recent one that I linked, that uh, Craig Armstrong Finding Beauty. I challenge anybody to find a song that exists that is more similar to that than the one that Yoko Kano wrote. I genuinely challenge... It can, if you find one, then maybe I'll change my perspective and I'll have learned something. That would be a good thing. But I highly doubt someone can find this. Like, she is the closest... At, like, sure, other things can be inspired. You can hear similarities. But she's consistently the closest multiple times throughout his, her career. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what gets me, right? Yeah. 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 It's... Yeah, it's it's too much. <laughs> uh, I I if it went to court, I would be shocked if it, you know, if it wasn't determined to be copyright infringement. If Katy Perry's Dark Horse can be considered copyright infringement for that nonsense Christian rap mm -hmm. or whatever for shit that didn't even sound similar, yeah, uh, then theoretically it would have to be. But you know, it's still in general, like I'm I'm uh, I'm a fan of more creative artistic freedom i like less restrictions on what people can do however i think that ethically as an artist if you are taking inspiration from something else you should be honest about it at the very least mm -hmm. i like the idea of people being able to sample music yes i think that death grips is ex-military um created something new out of old things mm -hmm. they're not allowed to sell it legally uh there was no actual case they probably got some legal threats and decided that they would pull it from all the streaming platforms, right? So they don't sell it. It's still available. You can download it for free. They're just not selling it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I would, I would, I, I think that that's an album where, like, yeah, I, sure, you, you can, you can pinpoint exactly what they sampled, but they created something so wildly different that it's like really, like, they should just be able to do it. Like it's yeah, their sure. own thing. You just, there's the got to be like some kind of, piano. yeah, there's got to be some kind of credit there, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. credit, and then a conscious effort to make it your own thing. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what are you doing? Yeah. Yeah, really. for sure. Are you going to keep watching that thing? Um, yeah, I'll watch a little bit more and see what else he says about it. Sure. That accusation, I was particularly annoyed by that because it's attempting to detract from the absolutely incredible work that Yoko Kano has done in her career. All right, moving on. Next tune we're going to look at, Bad Dog, No Biscuits. I don't care how bad my dog is. I'm probably still oh, I think he's done talking about that particular thing, I'm guessing. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. Because... Uh, Believe it or not, I do think that copyright infringement can happen, or let's just say ripping off, because it's not, it's not ever really determined to be copyright infringement until it's determined in court, and even then, it's like, I don't know how much of it is just public opinion, right? Yeah, and I wouldn't expect a jury to understand anyway, right? Yeah, it's really unfortunate. Jesus, like, when you start explaining to people that, like, oh, my God, like, every song uses the same four chords, like, people will think, like, oh, my God, like, every song is just copied from each other, not realizing that, like, yeah. just chords, that doesn't really mean anything. Like, you think it, that's that's nothing about, about a song, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you can't copyright a chord progression. You can't copyright a drum beat, right? Mm -hmm. There are certain things that are just, like, if it would set such a negative precedent that literally people wouldn't be able to write music anymore. Yeah, exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, it, in general, I, I I would say that there should be a lot less restriction, but ethically for Yoko Kano, I'd, I would prefer if the original artists were credited, at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, damn, anything mm -hmm. else uh, exciting? You know what? Life? Yeah. I'm just, yeah, I'm excited to be not cooped up in my house. Um, I enjoyed this chat. I needed it. I've been kind of uh, going stir crazy, just watching things on the couch all the time, and I just kind of, you know, hopping in people's streams now, just looking for 
some good chats. Yeah. Because, uh, well, I got tendonitis, and so um, I had to like stop my editing for the past month and a half and just watch shit instead. Because it's like, oh, I can still work, just not do that part of the work. Jeez, are you like clicking a ton of shit for the editing stuff? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, like mouse movements, keyboard movements, like a lot of hotkeys, and mm -hmm. you know, because I've been doing it so long, it's like a really fast, you know, a lot of fast motions. Gotcha. Because I guess, yeah, because I'm thinking all... my experience on video editors, and it's a lot of me looking around for what the fuck I'm doing, so I, you're probably actually clicking yeah. more quick than it's like, I am, yeah. It's like <laughs> rapid fire, like, <laughs> basically. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, even that, and then just like on my phone, and also um, because COVID, the natural breaks that I would have been taking in a given year, Mm -hmm. where I wasn't at my computer or on my phone and I was at a convention or a film festival or family or something, those natural breaks didn't happen this year. And so that's what caused, I guess, an issue that was already there that I didn't really really treat seriously or recognize mm -hmm. as a serious thing. It just became something worse. Sure. But it's feeling a lot better than it was before, and I'm excited to get back to... To doing shit, because I can only just watch things on the couch for so long, and it's, yeah, yeah. I can I'm excited imagine. to go outside. I'm excited to do things. Do you have I like a big to speed up? Do you have any big like COVID like, I'm free now like a big event or anything planned or something going to go like a theme? Yeah, park or... I've um, I'm making travel plans, but I don't want to reveal what I'm doing publicly because it's going to be a, kind of a secret. It's gonna. I'm gonna make some content out of it, and it'll be a tax write-off trip. And um, <laughs> uh, yeah, making travel plans for later in the year. Um, and then I've got family members that are planning on visiting at some point in the summer, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just ex excited and anxious to just get back to things. Just feel like I'm living life again. Gotcha. Get out of the house. Anyway, thanks for the chat. That was yeah. fun. No problem. Good luck. Remember to hit that like and subscribe, and don't forget the notification bell so that my videos show up right in your feed. I'm a boomer. I have to figure out how to leave. You can Sorry. Bye-bye. <laughs>